When you look around, what do you see? Are you upset to find all the fallen trees? The sun is lost in all the grave. All the hurt's been done, they looked away. But you are strong and you are young. Feet in the dirt and you feel your lungs. You know. That was the amazing Adalia Terra, who wrote that inspiring song specifically for this conference. Wow, what a beautiful voice. Thank you so much, Adalia. My name is Lisa Hilmi. I'm the Executive Director of Core Group. Welcome everyone from around the globe to our 23rd year of Core Group's annual Global Health Practitioner Conference. The next two days marks an important step in prioritizing early childhood, child and adolescent health and well-being in the next decade leading up to 2030. And although we're virtual, we pay tribute and recognize indigenous people whose land we occupy. 2020 was a challenging year, and yet we all came together to form new 
collaborations and partnerships to address the COVID-19 pandemic. We also spoke out and we advocated loudly to say Black Lives Matter and continue this work for racial justice in our organizations, our programs, our policies, and we want action for change. Together, we will do more in 2021. Sadly, we lost loved ones during 2020, and I especially like to acknowledge two people that had a lasting impact on core group and country programs for about 60 years, David Newberry and Connie Gates. You can learn more about their incredible work and dedication to community health on the core group website. As a pediatric nurse, I salute my colleagues. 2020 was the year of the nurse and midwife and 2021 is the international year of health and care workers, recognizing that 80% of the health workforce are women and we must ensure that programs for child health and adolescent health are gender transformative and they're formed by women, by grandmothers, by mothers and adolescents themselves. We support and celebrate all of the health and care workers that are on the front land during the pandemic, taking care of our families and our communities. Thank you so much for your work. We hope you'll engage and virtually network the next two days with the many individuals that have come together that are dedicated to early childhood, child and adolescent health. We also could not have done this without our global planning committee, our board of directors, you the audience, and our sponsors. So please visit our sponsors exhibition booths. It's on the conference platform, schedule meetups with them, network with them. We have a really amazing lineup for the next two days and there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for engagement. I'm now going to hand over the key to unlock potential in the next decade for our conference to Ahmed Arley, Core Group Polio Project's Horn of Africa Secretariat Director also a nurse, a frontline worker, and a board member. Ahmed, over to you to unlock the potential. Thanks, Lisa. Let's take this key and unlock the potential for the next decade for child and adolescent health and well-being and open the conference. I am excited as a board member of COGRU and the Secretary Director for Horn of Africa Co-Group Polio Project, that this conference is happening at a critical time for children and adolescents. I am here in Nairobi and know firsthand there needs to be further emphasis on the problems related to child and adolescent health and well-being, including high mortality and morbidity from vaccine-preventable diseases, malnutrition, early pregnancy and childbirth, mental health, among many others. There are thousands of people registered for this important conference joining from around the world. It shows the power of collaboration. And I am thrilled there will be a lot of learning in the next two days. With that, let me unlock the potential and start the conference. It is my utmost pleasure to introduce Mercy Juma, the incredible BBC Health Africa journalist who has reported on many of the issues related to child and adolescent health and well-being. She will lead us through some great discussions today. Mercy, thank you so much. Nice to be working with you again and over to you. Thank you very much, Lisa. It is my pleasure to see you on this virtual stage once again. And a huge thank you to you and the core group team together with all the amazing partners who have worked tirelessly over the last few weeks to make these very important discussions happen. Now, like you heard, my name is Masi Juma and I am absolutely honored to be part of these discussions. A huge shout out to all of you who have joined us today, close to 3000 registrants from all over the world. That is absolutely wonderful. And before we proceed, could you just let us know where you are joining us from? There is a poll uh, which is displayed as a link on the screen. So click it and let's see which countries are here. Again, thank you for being part of the Global Health Practitioners Conference 2021. I've just seen on the chat that Nigeria has more than 60 registrants. 
Let's see which other country beats that. Now, as Lisa mentioned, we are moving into a new decade and we are smack in the middle of a pandemic. No one is sure of how things are going to evolve, but right now, I want to believe that all of us have witnessed the adverse effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on different categories of people. And children and adolescents are generally at low risk of infection. And if they become infected, we know it is likely to be mild, but the impact of COVID-19 on early childhood, child and adolescent health and well-being is enormous. We have schools disrupted, we have essential health uh, services like routine immunization and sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents. They are you know, greatly interrupted. And the big ask right now is for organizations and professionals to come together and employ a multi-thronged approach to address these challenges so that we don't undo the gains that we have made so far. And that is the foundation of our opening plenary for this conference. You know, in a short while, I will have on the virtual stage a panel of four or five persons to discuss how we unlock the potential of children and adolescents in the next decade. And we're talking about children and adolescents across the globe, not those who live in the first world country, uh, countries and forgetting those who are less privileged or who don't have the resources. But before this panel comes up live, let us hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Tedros and Hanom Gabriel-Jesus, who is the WHO Director General. Welcome, Dr. Tedros. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, the world's children are under assault. The attacks are coming from every direction. A rapidly changing climate, air pollution, environmental degradation, mass marketing of harmful products, and growing economic, social, and educational inequities. For many, these factors are compounded by conflict, forced displacement, and malnutrition. The COVID-19 pandemic is the latest insult to childhood, disrupting education, mental well-being and livelihoods while increasing the potential for abuse. It does not have to be this way. Solutions are within reach. The past two decades show that rapid progress is possible in improving health, education, and poverty reduction. I offer three critical areas for the attention of governments, civil society, and communities. First, invest in children's health, education, and development. Second, reduce carbon emissions now. Third, regulate harmful marketing. Improvements to children's health and well-being far outweigh their costs. They last a lifetime and they're passed along to future generations. Each of you is engaged on the front line of this critical struggle to allow children to not only survive, but to thrive. I wish you a fruitful deliberations. By working together, we can build a healthier, fairer, and more sustainable world for all. I thank you. Great. Always insightful to hear from you, Dr. Tedros, and thank you for your service and leadership. We wish you all the very best, more so during these unprecedented times. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to our roundtable, which I am greatly honored to moderate. And on the virtual bench, allow me to welcome Andrew Molly, who's the World Vision International President and Chief Executive Officer. Hey, Andrew. Nice to see you. And Andrew is also an ordained minister in the Anglican Church. He's passion is to see an end to extreme poverty in his lifetime. Next, we have Dr. Anshu Banerjee, uh, who is the director for WHO's Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging. He has 30 and more years in public health and has worked in a variety of capacities with civil society, bilateral agencies, funding agencies, and definitely the WHO. So nice to see you, Dr. Anshu. And then we also have Grace Gatera joining us from Chigali, Rwanda. She works as an advisor for the Welcome Trust 
mental health priority area and is also a young leader for the Lancet Commission for Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. Nice to see you, uh, Grace. In Kenya, we say Karibu Sana. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I have Sadia Rahman, who is an advocate for youth rights. She is currently playing the role of youth focal point in 2020. And she has been instrumental in organizing the first ever National Youth Concern Family Planning in Bangladesh. Um, Sadia, really nice to see you. And I'm looking forward to uh, this afternoon, morning, or evening, depending on where in the world again you're joining us from. And panel, thank you so much for creating time to be here today. And to open this very brief discussion, minutes is not a lot of time. I will invite each one of you to briefly tell us what you strongly feel are the issues we should prioritize in this decade. And most important, what is the key to unlocking potential? Keeping in mind that the group you're talking about right here now is, you know, uh, children and adolescents all the way from early childhood and into, you know, depending on which country you're coming from, adolescents. Yeah. I will start with you, Dr. Anshu. What is the key to unlock potential? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercy. And I would like to highlight some points that the WHO Youth Lancet Commission has made last year, uh, really looking at what are the risks that children have at the moment, such as uh, road traffic accidents, uh, deaths due to air pollution, um, also issues around nutritious food, violence against children, uh, the fact that there is no space for them to play, etc. So this is really a multi-sectoral agenda. And what we felt was that we really need to put the child at the center of the SDGs and really look at how we can address all these multi-sectoral um, risk factors and issues in order for them to be able to survive, thrive and transform. And of course, many of these risk factors also have been exacerbated by climate change. We know that climate change has led to disruption of water systems. It has led to uh, malnutrition due to disruption of food systems, food production systems, and also due to the proliferation of factor-borne diseases. And so looking at this uh, and looking at who are the biggest polluters and who are the ones who, um, basically um, are, are the ones who are suffering from that, uh, it's clear that high income countries are the biggest polluters, and though they're uh, mortality rates and morbidity rates for children are the lowest, um, that they contribute to the highest pollution globally, resulting in this climate change, and therefore also resulting in impact, uh, particularly for children in low-income countries. Um, the other thing that was also very important that we felt was that how do we make this multi-sectorality visible at the country level? And how can we make sure that, for example, a president or a prime minister with you know, one look at a dashboard has an idea whether their multi-sectoral policies are actually keeping the child in mind and putting them at the center of the SDGs. And so there's work ongoing in looking on how to do that and how to make that more visible. The other thing that was also very important, as Dr. Tedros mentioned, was commercial marketing and really looking at the impact of internet technology, et cetera, on promoting tobacco, alcohol, sugar sweetened beverages, but also even looking at how the industries are tricking children into gambling. And we felt that you know, this was an important area and that self-regulation clearly does not work. It's really important that this needs to be addressed globally and because it's an agenda that crosses borders and that we uh, propose that it would be important to have maybe an optional protocol in the Convention for the Rights of the Child so that countries could sign up to this and uh, make legislative, legislative changes in order to really regulate commercial marketing to the sense, in the sense that uh, for harmful uh, commercial marketing. And just to give an example, we know that in a number of countries, children at the age of five could already identify logos of tobacco companies with the brand name. And, and so this is really worrying. Um, the other thing also just to highlight is that when we look at financial investments, we know that in low income countries, actually the amount of money needed to achieve the SDGs is only $195 per person or per capita. 
that is not such a big amount of money. So we know that by 2030, it should be possible to achieve the SDGs if the right kind of allocation of, uh, if the right kind of fund allocation is made in order uh, to support these multi-sectoral policies and put the child there at the center. I'll stop at this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anshu. And Grace, I will come uh, to you next. What, according to you, do you feel are the keys to unlocking potential? Mm. That is a good question. Um, like they said, my name is Grace Katera. I'm from Kigali, Rwanda, and I, I'm a lived experience um, mental health advocate. I'm quickly living the young, but uh, I still identify as young, um, uh, so I can, for now, speak for them. Um, so when I heard the title of uh, this conference, of this session, Unlocking Potential, I was really, I wanted to, I was very confused as to whom, how, for what. And then I thought, um, when we, whenever we talk about unlocking young people's potential, we already have a predetermined idea of what that may look like. This may differ from really region to region, but as an African, I can tell you that some of our ideas of unlocked potential are the same across the continent. Are we good at school? Are young people good at school? Are they good at school at what matters? Usually it's sciences or humanities. If they are out of school, uh, traditional employment is preferred. Sometimes it feels like uh, our potential can and only is only unlocked when we contribute to a capitalistic world. This way of being productive or having potential unlocked uh, can be detrimental to young people's mental health and thus their health in general. I'm, I am definitely, not, we, we will not ignore the headlines that come out every year of young people who failed and then they, you know, they, they take their lives or young people who failed and then they, you know, are homeless because they're not really unlocking their potential as, you know, the way we have predetermined it to be. We say we must create a better future for our young people. We say we are in a new generation. But I think that uh, in order for, uh, for it to happen, we need to create a better now for young people. How do we do this? I think the simplest key to unlocking young people's potential is by asking them what matters to them. They have been shouting this from the rooftops uh, since since we, we all were young people, I think every time we're young, we have so many ideas. We just want people who are in power, who are in authority to listen to us. Uh, we, and that's why I say that we need to start trusting young people to know what unlocks their own potential. Young people are brave. We know this because they create movements that we admire, that we want to do, but are too you know, held back by our adultness. Um, point in mind, I think we all know Malala Yousafzai in education. Uh, we know Vanessa Nakate, uh, who is in Uganda, who, who is fighting for the environment. We know young people like Chantel making change through art in South Africa. Maria Hauslave, who is the you know NCD child uh, uh, chair. Gian in, in Indonesia fighting tobacco companies. Damien, Shinwendu, Kumba, who are revitalizing the mental health movement across Africa. And these are just a few out of the many out there. There are millions of young people wanting to make change, fighting to make change. I think that after, I think that in order to help them, I think that in order to capitalize on unlocking their potential, we can, we can, we, we must listen, but we also have to act on it. It is not enough to just ask. I think we, use, we should use the inordinate power that we still have to make decisions for young people to make changes now, urgently. Maybe this way, as we create a better now, we will help create the future we envision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grace. You've, you've raised new really valid points. Like we need to, you know, ask people, young people, what truly matters to them. And we need to trust young people. And very, very valid points, especially for this conference, when we focus on young people, when you focus on children and adolescents. And now we go to Sadia. Do you agree with what Grace says? What really matters to you when we talk about unlocking potential for the youth and the young people? Thank you, Mercy. I totally agree with uh, Grace. And as um, I have been working for youth, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights for the past 
four years in Bangladesh. And while I was initiating the first National Youth Conference on Family Planning, you know, that was the first uh, identified gap that we had, that we didn't have any, um, any integrated platform for our young people to come and claim their rights and also have an integrated platform to talk with our policymakers. So having that in our mind, we actually started the conference. And when we are uh, when we're saying that what are the keys to unlock potential, and I, I was actually having in my mind, what is locking, what are the factors that's currently locking the potential that young people have? So uh, I think, uh, an equal partnership can be one of the major keys to unlock potential. And, and when I say equal partnership, I, I definitely mean meaningful youth participation. And meaningful youth participation, I mean an inclusive, intentional, and, and mutually respected partnership between adolescents, youths, and adults, and where the power is shared. And, um, you know, uh, when meaningful youth participation is ensured and there are equal partnership, uh, I think young people are more equipped to claim their own rights. And whenever we are able to um, ensure that, I think that's, uh, the, uh, that's the starting of unlocked potential of young people. And also what the main issues we need to focus on uh, in the next decade, I, I think that's uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights for young people. Because you know, when uh, young people is ha uh, have full autonomy over, over her body, or young women have full autonomy over her body, she can have autonomy over her life. And she can decide when, when she, she will get married, whom she will get married, and, and how many children she will have, and, and maybe access to safe abortion and quality family planning services. These little components, these major components, makes her empowered. And, and, and the SDGs, the goals we are actually, all of us are talking about, these goals will only be successful when we start making changes in individual women's life and on the ground they can make informed choices. So I think, uh, this should be the main issue we should focus on the next decade. Thank you, Mercy. Well, thank you very much, Tadia. And now we go to Andrew, who, like I mentioned, is also, you know, uh, comes from the church and he will give us a, sp a perspective on that. So Andrew, according to you, what are the keys to unlocking the potential of young people going into the next decade, the next 10 years? What should we focus on? Thank you, Mercy. And as you said, we're here today to talk about unlocking potential, prioritising child and adolescent health. But we can't talk about health on its own, in isolation. As Adalia Talia put it in her wonderful opening song, let's all see a future where everyone wins. Across our work in 100 countries, we agree with Dr Anshu, health is multi-sectorial. We see a child's health is linked inextricably to education, to protection from violence, and from protection from child marriage, and also nutrition, family livelihoods, amongst other sectors. This is expressed by the Child Rights Convention. We've also contributed to and celebrate the nurturing care framework for young children because it acknowledges this multi-sector nature of child well-being. Take the story of Neha, who we are supporting right now in India. She faced an arranged marriage as a teenager, and she told me, I never weighed myself. I didn't take vaccinations. I would hardly talk to anyone. I delivered my son, Arpit, at home. He fell sick very often, and this continued for almost two years. She became involved in one of our projects at World Vision and learned about the importance of a balanced diet and the imperatives of immunization. Harpit, her second child, is now four months old, and he's much healthier. What's more, Niha now works as a volunteer training other young mothers on how to help themselves, but how to bring health to themselves and their children. So it's a story of support and empowerment and of protection with health at its core. And all of us here today know that sadly, Niha's experience is all too common. Maternal and child health is absolutely crucial, but Neha's story is really a story of childhood marriage. 
children, and let's remember that Neha is just a child, must be protected from that. That's why World Vision is deeply invested in our global campaign to end violence against children alongside our campaigning around child health and adolescent health. We know that a 10% reduction in child marriage can contribute 70% reduction in maternal mortality rates and a 3% increase in infant mortality. So how do we right across the health centre achieve all of this? The answer is we do it together. The concept of universal health coverage ratified by the UN all the way back in 2019 compels us to reach out beyond conventional partners and to embrace expertise. We do this with partners. 200,000 frontline community health workers are supported by World Vision and 400,000 faith leaders across all faiths who work alongside in 100 countries. But most importantly, and to end, let's listen to the children and adolescents we serve. Only then can we truly bring health and hope to a generation of girls and boys who need that now more than ever. Thank you. Andrew for those solid points and I'll just go back around uh, to all of you once again and let's expound on this a bit and again I'll start with you Dr. Anshu. Uh, the Lancet report launched about a year ago calls for a holistic view of the child and you know when you spell out the urgency for a broader plan to accelerate progress in areas previously neglected you know you, you all have raised points about early childhood development, adolescent health and disability. How do we, building from that report, actionize all these at the country level, looking at the child in a holistic view? So I think it's very important uh, that we have a kind of higher level committee at the national level or a commission, a, a child commission at the national level that looks at this multisectorality and is really driven or led, say, by the prime minister or the president or uh, someone at that level. Um, often what we um, find is that when uh, sectors want to engage with another sector, uh, there's the issue of, well, you know, this is one minister versus another minister, and who can um, sort of uh, tell the other one what to do? And so it's good, therefore, to have something that goes beyond the different departments, the different ministries, and is uh, one step higher and is uh, overseen by, let's say, the president or the prime minister to really take this for forward as a political agenda. That's one. I think the voices of civil society, very important, parliamentarians, very important, and also the voice of uh, the, the child is very important. Uh, when we uh, put the Lancet uh, uh, Commission report together, it was, you know, we interviewed children and we asked them what was important for them. And what they said was families were important to them, family togetherness. It was important to have a clean environment. It was important for them to have opportunities to play. We know, as just mentioned, there are many children who are still uh, in child labor and don't have opportunities to play. And also access to education was highlighted as very important. And I think that the COVID pandemic has really highlighted that particular point, that educational settings are not only a setting where children learn, it's also important for their nutritional status, it's important for their social skills development, it's important for their mental health well-being. It's important for them to be able to access services. There is so much that goes around education. It's really multisectoral. And so it's important that, that we are able to address that more holistically. Um, I think the other thing also that is important is equity and that this is for all children. We should be able to identify those children that are not being served and that... Um, it's not only about bringing health services to children, but it's also about bringing services that all children need in order to develop properly and to be supported, whether it's socially, whether it's um, for their mental health development, school education, etc. It needs to be a complete package that all children can benefit from in order to achieve their full potential. Thank you, Dr. Anshu. And then, you know, you talk about, you know, the voice of the child being very important when you're talking about uh, what you asked children and youth, what they really want. And Sadia, you know, the, the questions are being posed, like children and youth and adolescents are being asked, what do you want? And they're giving their opinion and their, you know, valid wants and needs. How can we then ensure that young people are more involved 
in the design of solutions, especially with regard to sexually rep sexual and reproductive health rights, and just ensure that they have a voice in their own health and most importantly, well-being. Sadia? Well, um, as I was actually mentioning meaningful youth engagement, it has different components. And um, meaningful youth engagement says that when a program or uh, is designed, young people would be engaged from the very beginning in the designing, uh, designing that, implementing that, and even after when we are evaluating the program. So whenever there is something being initiated for particularly young people, there should be young people on the table making the plans for themselves and ensuring whatever their needs are, are mentioned in that program. And also I think um, the, the uh, young people should act locally, start acting locally as well because uh, Organizing local programs, local events with our policymakers, our 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 uh, local uh, gatekeepers who actually hinders the opportunities for us, that actually helps to uh, have a negotiation with the system as well. During this COVID in Bangladesh, particularly, the ratio of gender-based violence uh, with women has increased a lot. So, when this happened, I was actually thinking what could be the possible solution. So, because in this pandemic, having a uh, having a call center, having a number of a call center doesn't help. So that's where the local authorities come in help in the first place. And and I think in other in other dimensions as well for sexual and reproductive health, if we can act start acting locally with a group of young people. If you're young people, organize uh, organize your own conference on on uh, maybe uh, organize a uh, national conference on health with health practitioners, what we are having now globally. Maybe have a dialogue with, uh, with your local commissioner or chairman uh, or the thing, um, as FP 2020 Youth Focal Point, I have been doing that engaging different young people uh, with the other different stakeholders like UNFPA, USAID, DFID, and, and the um, DGFP of uh, Bangladesh as well. So this could be one of these solutions. And also uh, if uh, I get back to meaningful youth engagement again, like Whenever we say young people on board, we shouldn't be tokenized like, okay, we have to have a young people on the table or let's have them, but giving that young people voice, uh, giving that, uh, 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 recognizing the effort that young people is giving and making sure that young people is safe and she's not being, uh, they're not being discriminated uh, for having a view or having a background. So I think if we, we can compile all these components together and, and have a young adult, meaningful young adult partnership, I, I think we, we, we are on like halfway done. And uh, I think we have to, we have to ensure that. All right, great. And now I'll go back to Andrew. And, you know, we talked about a holistic view of, of the child and just uh, Dr. Andrew mentioned about having a multi-sectoral look at how we view the child and how we view the adolescents and young people. How do we then ensure that, or maybe you can give us a perspective from a faith-based community. How do we, you know, rope you in in all these to ensure that we prioritize child and adolescent health initiatives? And most importantly, what can we do to stop child violence and just ensure that we see things like in immunizations coverage increasing and ensure mental health needs of adolescent young people are addressed? And this is also something that I will ask Grace to address. Thank you. And faith leaders are absolutely crucial partners. I was hearing from a UN partner this week that often faith leaders and community leaders are the only voices with trust in a community because many political institutions have seen trust falling. Many experts have seen trust falling. But to give you an idea of scale, we work with 400,000 faith leaders in over 50 countries. That's people of all faiths and they're trusted, and they can be an instrumental part as an example of the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. Let me tell you a story and give you an example from 
the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, which I visited around this time last year. It was my last visit to the field, actually. I was in North Kivu province in eastern DRC in the city of Goma, and we tackled Ebola there through our Channels of Hope programme with faith partners. But what struck me, you can have all the vaccines and technology in the world, but getting them accepted by communities can be very difficult. And that's where we come in with the faith partners. As an example, we had a thermal thermometer that was used in DRC, and this was like a gun that was put to people's heads to check their temperature. She told me how she'd received the Ebola vaccine and her neighbours thought it would cause her to die. And so she stayed away from, they stayed away from her. And she used this temperature gun to show people it was safe. She had the vaccine to show it was safe. And an imam in that same community received the vaccine right there in front of his mosque. And this made a world of difference because word soon spread that this was OK, that this vaccine was OK, it was safe. And defeating Ebola was all about community trust and acceptance through faith leaders. And these are the same relationships that will be used extremely effectively for COVID-19, not just in the DRC, but across the world. So faith leaders are incredibly important. And the same is true for mental health, calling out mental health as a need and making practical steps in addressing mental health can be a real catalyst in the faith communities. And that can spread across communities where faith leaders take a lead. Thank you very much. And, and, and Grace, just to come back to that uh, question on mental health very, very quickly, how do we ensure that when you're talking about mental health uh, for children and adolescents, how do we ensure that the underserved are not left behind? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So globally, there's been an uptick in the talk of mental health. I'd like to say that it's because uh, COVID-19 has exposed, uh, you know, weak the weakness in our systems, the weakness of, you know, not budgeting for, not thinking about mental health. Uh, a little shout out for my country. Rwanda had uh, standard operating procedures put in place as early as February 2020. I think the past showed us that it's really great to plan early and account for the people who will need these services before it happens. And I think that's that's the same thing we should do. Globally, the conversation has picked up, but it still lacks a key voice of young people and people with lived experience in low and middle income countries. Uh, much like you know, world tours by famous singers, uh, we still are a non-existent. Uh, my recommendations are, are very simple. There should be dedicated resources uh, by, you know, made by country budgets, but also by organizations that fund countries, especially those in low and middle income countries. These should be for specialized services in regards to mental health for children, for adolescents and for young people. The money exists, find it. Uh, secondly, there needs to be active, like, like Sadia said, there needs to be active participation and co-production with young people and people with lived experience in terms of what works for them in regards to their mental health. Do not just pass the mic, throw the whole thing away and start uh, listening and actively co-producing. And then thirdly, and finally, there people on the ground who are doing the work. Uh, Andrew has just talked about, you know, faith leaders community leaders, grassroots organizations, peer support workers. Those are people who have been doing this work since time immemorial. I think that we should not reinvent the world, but rather utilize what is there um, and pay them adequately so that they can continue to do the excellent work that they've been doing. Back to you, Mercy. Thank you very much, Grace. I think these are discussions that you can have for you know days without really you know, are getting tired of talking about them. Let me just pick a few questions from what we are seeing on the chat box. We have Mwansa who is asking, how best can one find a solution towards protecting adolescents from digital harm? And I think I will ask Andrew to answer this. How best can yeah. we find a solution towards protecting adolescents from digital harm? That is Mwansa asking. Yes, thank you, Mwansa. The, 
this idea of protecting adolescents and more increasingly actually even small children now need protection from digital harm, particularly as they move to schooling, which is remote and relies upon digital. The first thing I would say is we need to talk about it. This is one of those things that's a dirty little secret that's hidden under the carpet. And we need to expose it. We need to get it out into the open and talk about it. Again, I think this is a, a place where faith leaders can ab have an absolute role in talking about the dangers and the challenges of digital harm. But also, I'm amazed by how little politicians talk about this, particularly as we move to remote schooling. So the first thing I would say, and actually, I don't think anything else can happen until we do this, we've got to open a dialogue where this real issue a massive challenge, and UNICEF called this out. Henrietta Fall was on a panel with me just this week, and she was calling out exactly what an issue we see digital harm is for children and adolescents. So let's start the conversation, because as a first step, until we do that, nothing will change. Thank you very much, Andrew. And then another question, very briefly, Dr. Anshu. Santosh is talking about sexual and reproductive health, and they are asking, how do we ensure that we address the inequality or imbalance between, you know, the people in the urban areas and the people in the rural areas or people in the areas that are not well developed? Because it feels that urban settings are not prepared to accommodate or to address increasing number of adolescents. So how do we look at that imbalance? Dr. Thank you. Anshu? Thank you. It's very important that... Um, Youth services are made available, and not only that they're made available um, generally, but that they're also um, made available with confidentiality. So that's a very important point, I think. Um, this requires uh, a lot of discussion. Often uh, there are sometimes healthcare workers who feel uncomfortable to talk about family, family planning services with younger people. And so I think there is need for work on both ends. One on making services available, ensuring that they are confidential, but at the same time also in making healthcare workers comfortable to talk about these things with younger people and uh, provide these services to them. Now, the rural-urban divide, I think, um, is an important issue. Uh, we know that um, rurally, of course, uh, often people live in a smaller community and uh, the confidentiality there might be even more difficult to ensure, while in urban settings, it might be easier to uh, ensure confidentiality because services can be accessed, um, let's say, in, in a more, in a way that promotes confidentiality more. But I think these are two important issues, confidentiality and also comfortable, um, uh, that people are comfortable to talk about this and to provide these services. And that is both for uh, the providers, as well as for younger people to be able to uh, feel comfortable and to do so. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Anshu. And thank you, everyone on the chat, for keeping the conversations going. Please do ask your questions. We will always cover them as we go along. And also remember that we are on social media. So feel free to, you know, put out what you feel uh, has really touched you or what you think is really important. Go on social media, on Twitter or Facebook, and let people know that the GHPC 2021 is taking place, uh, organized by the core group. And now I will just go for one last round. One simple sentence, dear panelists. What is the way forward to improve health and well-being? Or what can all the people watching, the thousands of people that are attending, what can they do to make progress on early childhood, child and adolescent health and well-being? Just one sentence, starting with you, Chris. One sentence. Hmm, I have a lot of words, <laughs> uh, but I'd just say uh, <laughs> active participation. Active yeah. participation. Great. Sadia? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just take two more sentences, maybe, because, uh, hey, this is like, it's, it's uh, it's been 25,000 uh, 25 years and more of ICPD 
And uh, have you ever thought why there's no significant change in uh, the reproductive and uh, sexual, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights of adolescents and young people? So maybe um, the answer would be maybe the young people has not been added as uh, equal partners. So, uh, so, and it, it doesn't look like you are progressing with that us anyway. So, yeah, here we are, uh, make us the equal partners, and maybe that is the key to unlock all the potentials and achieve SRHR for young people. Thank you. Yeah, so make us equal partners. Sadia, that was a paragraph. That was not a sentence. <laughs> All right. Let's get to do, uh, Dr. Anshu. One sentence. What is the way forward to improve health and well-being of, uh, in early childhood and in children and adolescents? Um, I think voice. I think we need to keep on voicing this issue. Um, it shouldn't be forgotten. Um, currently, with the COVID pandemic, everyone is talking about econo economic recovery, but child and adolescent health and well-being needs to be part of that. They are the future. They are the future. Andrew, one sentence. How do we move on from here? Yeah, I promise, I promise not to give you a paragraph. Um, one sentence. I would say listen to, empower, and give participation to children and adolescents so this is something that they solve as well as being affected by. Full stop. Wow. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Anshu, Grace, Sadia, and Andrew for your insights on how to unlock potential in early childhood and among adolescents. Our esteemed audience, that marks the end of our opening plenary, and it is only a fraction of what we have in store for you. So at this point, we will move to the concurrent sessions, which are accessible from the links in the agenda section of the website. They will start immediately. So please pick your room and I hope you have fruitful deliberations. Once again, remember to keep the conversation going on social media and on chat and see you. I will see you in the closing plenary. Have a wonderful time in the breakouts.